Gynex and Shaft. Shaft and Gynex. Both are studios that have brought us some of the best examples of the medium, from Gurren Lagann to the Monogatari series to Evangelion. They're two of the biggest names in anime. So, what happens when these industry titans decide to team up for a series? Introducing Mahoromatic Automatic Maiden. Mahoromatic Automatic Maiden is, at first glance, an ecchi harem anime much like what you'd find in Maho Sensei Negima or Love Hina. In reality, it's a series that pushes the limits of what any one genre typically allows. It dabbles a bit in the realm of hardcore battle anime, there's a little existential drama mixed in there somewhere, and to top it all off, the ending takes a chance with some Ghost in the Shell slash Cowboy Bebop stylings that left me incredibly unsure how I felt about it until a month after I finished. If that wasn't enough to get you interested, this was done back in 2001 and 2002 when anime was still very much a niche that wasn't at all guaranteed to receive a solid western base. It's still a niche, but compared to the industry of the modern day, it's certain you'll notice a significant difference if you look. Mahoromatic Automatic Maiden follows, first and foremost, a combat android named V1046R Mahoro, also known as Mahoro Ando. Mahoro was created by an elite organization called Vesper to fight a secret alien invasion. As she reaches the end of her lifespan, she's given a choice. Continue fighting and expire sooner, or retire and spend her remaining time doing something she'd truly enjoy. She chooses the latter, deciding to become a maid and offer her services to a young middle schooler named Suguru Misato. I know, this series sounds like a cross between Plastic Memories and Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, right? I'd see how you might think so, but I think it goes a bit further than that. While the series is predominantly a romantic comedy, underneath the surface is a suspicion that at any point, things will take a turn for the worse. I mean, each episode of the series ends by reminding us how long Mahoro has left to live. Despite the laugh-out-loud comedy and heartwarming romance, the fact that Mahoro will die by the finale drives the stake further and further into our cold, dead hearts. It's a series with, as I said earlier, a blend of genres that's held together by the star power of both studios, including director Hiroyuki Yamaga, who is credited for his work in titles such as Neon Genesis Evangelion, Fully Cooly, and This Ugly Yet Beautiful World. It suddenly made a lot of sense to me that someone who worked on Evangelion was involved in this series, as there were times when I could have sworn there were some keyframes shared between the two series. On the Shaft side of things, the series is produced by Mitsutoshi Kubota, who is credited for work in titles such as Bakemonogatari, Hidamari Sketch, and Puella Magai Madoka Magica. I had difficulty seeing the extent of Shaft's influence in the series until the final few episodes of the first season, where the character design reminded me heavily of Madoka Magica. But as far as I can see, Kubota was the only one who worked on both titles, so it may be mere coincidence. In terms of the series' music, it's composed by none other than Toshio Masuda, who also composed for another relatively small unknown series. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, uh, but it's called Naruto? In both seasons, the OPs are performed by Ayako Kawasumi, the seiyu from Mahoro, and that helps the audience connect with the characters, at least it did for me. I'll admit, while we're on that note, that I watched the dubbed version of the series, which features a really interesting combination of actors, such as Bridget Hoffman as Mahoro, Derek Stephen Prince as the shy but popular Suguru Misato, and Lex Lang as Slash, among many others. I'm unable to find a specific year the dub was released, but I couldn't help but feel sort of nostalgic for the early days of anime dubbing. It reminded me of the Evangelion and Cowboy Bebop dub, both of which were great for their era, and Mahoromatic is no different. It's here where I'd like to put a warning, as I will be talking about certain plot decisions in the series, and it goes without saying there will be spoilers. If you haven't seen Mahoromatic yet, you can skip to the time you see on screen to return to safety, or you can proceed. It's up to you. I think the series really benefits from Mahoro's limited lifespan. Not only does it limit the overall length of the series, but it also, as I said, creates this layer of anxiety over how it'll end for her, 
and how Suguru and Slash will handle the loss. I really felt it in the final episodes of the series when Mahoro expresses her desire to continue living now that she's found something to live for. She may be made of plastic and silicone, but she's one of the most human characters in the cast. I will admit, however, I wasn't all that happy with how they ended up killing her off. It was kind of a bait and switch. The entire series is predicated on her running out of time and dying naturally like in plastic memories, but instead, Mahoro sacrifices herself to save Suguru, which paved the way for one of the most confusing and convoluted endings I've seen in a while. I think I understood this correctly, but if I didn't, feel free to correct me in a condescending manner down in the comments. In the war between humanity and the alien race known as Saint, there were three sides. The humans who resisted change, also known as management. The aliens known as Saint, whose only wish was to communicate with humans and the group in the middle who fought both in an effort to bring them together, Vesper. In the final episodes, it's not only revealed that Mahora was built using Saint technology, but also that she was a piece of the Saint God? Leader? It's not made explicitly clear. All that we know is they were connected in some way. In any case, Mahoro dies, Suguru decides he'll never go back home since she's not there, and the next time we see him is 20 years later when he's become a sort of Spike Spiegel Gene Starwind hybrid, fighting the management holdouts on a new planet colonized by both humans and Saint. I guess a lot can happen in 20 years, but I had such a hard time seeing any of the Suguru we knew in this new character. Especially since the idea of him falling that deeply in love with Mahoro was relatively new. Even if he was in love with her, it doesn't justify his decision to give up on his entire life once he loses her. It does, however, justify his hatred for androids if he internally blamed Mahoro for leaving him all alone. Speaking of dumb things, the series explicitly did what I wanted Plastic Memories not to do. It pulled a literal deus ex machina and brought Mahoro back to life through some confusing otherworldly mumbo jumbo. As she was part of Saint's leader, said leader just sacrificed part of their emotions or something to br bring her back 20 years later. It might as well have ended there, but then there's an ambiguous scene where it's not clear if any of this happened or not, and well, uh, I'll stop there before I have an aneurysm. I'll say this, however, Mahara Matic had the kind of ending that's like Clanad's ending, but unlike Clanad, I have no desire to break down the intricacies of Mahararmatic. I enjoyed the series, but not that much. All in all, I really did enjoy Mahararmatic Automatic Maiden. It wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, there were quite a few things I wish they hadn't done, but overall it's a great series with lovable yet flawed characters. I remember thinking as I reached the end that this is one I'd love to see a post-series OVA of so we can get a more concrete resolution, but it's by no means necessary. I tend to want that kind of thing for any series where I'm left with my jaw on the floor, so take from that what you will.